Trek favorites. What are yours? Welcome to Trek Favorites. This is a show where I get to talk to some of my friends about their favorite Trek, and I let you listen in. I think I've described it before as being a voyeur, which is probably not exactly what we meant, but, you know, it gets the idea across. This time, I'm happy to welcome Kelly Umont um, to tell me what her Trek favorite is. Kelly, it's great to see you. Thanks for being here. It's so nice to do this, and I love helping you uh, kick off a new show. It's always it's always fun to get to hang out with you, and I know sometimes it's only virtually, but I'm really excited to get to do this one. Good. Well, I, I really appreciate you doing it because I know you have some fairly strong feelings about a lot of science fiction series. And so it's <laughs> not really a surprise that Star Trek is <laughs> Um, and so I thought it was really interesting that you're going to take us to the very end of Star Trek The Next Generation mm -hmm. to talk about all good things. Yes. Um, so what is it? I mean, this was, I think, an emotional episode for a lot of folks because it's the end of the, the Next Generation TV show. Of course, they went on and did some movies. But mm -hmm. um, something that everyone had been living with week in and week out is now yes. going to be, you know, there's going to be a big crater there. So yeah. why did this particular episode, other than just the fact that it was the end, resonate with you? Well, for me personally, um, I had seen, um, you know, I grew up in the 80s when there was a whole lot of Star Trek and reruns, the original series. And so I remember, um, and this was all pre-internet for people who don't know, <laughs> um, there were sort of these rumors that it seemed like maybe they were going to make another Star Trek show which seemed kind of weird and like, how are they going to do that? And, you know, like, because, you know, news traveled a lot slower then and you only got it like in a magazine, maybe once a week, that sort of thing. So um, it was sort of this odd thing. And then it came out and people were sort of cautious, I guess. Um, everybody wanted to see more Star Trek. What does the future, you know, it's set in the future. It's in space. Everybody goes to different planets. There's aliens. It's great. And so I remember, um, like people who remembered the original series. Um, I remember that a lot of them talked about, um, having the same, having the excitement, you know, once, once we, uh, basically once Riker grew his beard, uh, it seemed like the series kind of found its footing. So if you're a casual watcher and you notice that Riker is clean shaven, you're probably fine to skip the episode. Um, that has been my personal experience. And so far, like that pretty much bears out through the, through the subsequent years, but it was really like looking forward every week to, um, this cast, this crew, the universe, you know, Romulans and Klingons and, uh, you know, new species that we met and a very different approach from a captain to what Kirk had, even though it was still the enterprise. And so, um, like this, this is the Star Trek of my people of my era, basically. Um, you know, I know people who remember the the original series when when it was out and when it was on TV, and you could sit down and watch it. Uh, I have no recollection of that because it all went off the air before I was born. So uh, this is sort of the my era of Star Trek, and so um, Janeway is my favorite captain, but I think I will always have a soft spot in my in my heart for Picard because he was my first, as it happened, captain you know, like live on TV, um, invested in the show as it came out each week to see what would happen. So um, he, so, and, you know, like you could do worse than Patrick Stewart as a person that you spend an hour of your weekend with every week for seven years. So um, I started sort of casually watching it at my house and eventually reeled in other members of my family. They would sort of come and go um, as, you know, the time changed because it was a syndicated show. And uh, we didn't have a whole lot of television um, when Star Trek first came out. So it was one of the few things available to watch, literally four channels. Um, so it was one of, you know, it was, there was a 25% chance that it was going to be the thing we were watching when it was on. Um, and so I just, I got more invested in it and cared more about the, pe about the characters. And as the world expanded and as the relationships built and, and you know, and the show hit its stride, um, it became something that that I always really liked, and it was a show that I made time for. 
Um, and sometimes that meant I would record it. Uh, I was really busy in high school, so uh, I wasn't always home when it was on. But um, I always made sure that I watched it every week uh, as it came out. And, you know, maybe I would watch it a couple of times if it was one that I had recorded to, in order to do, um, you know, get to spend a little bit more time with them. And then um, I went to college. And in college, um, I was in college when uh, the seventh series aired and when the show came to an end. And uh, there was a, a department at my school that was called the Intact Department, and it was basically student-led classes. And uh, I had a friend who, in the theater department, I know that will, sh that will surprise some people, um, I had a friend in the theater department who said, uh, I'm going to teach this class, um, will you sign up? You don't have to take it, but I just have to get five people to say that uh, they would take it if it were offered. And so I said I would. And then I decided, you know, I think I will. Like, it's, one, it's, you know, two hours, one night a week. And one of those hours is watching an episode of Star Trek. There are worse things. So um, I, so we watched, so we, I, I took this class. And the finale, this was a spring term class. And so the series finale ended up being the end of uh, the term. And so my final for that class was watching uh, the two parts of uh, All Good Things. And so that's another reason that it's sort of dear to me is that I actually got to watch, as a bonus, uh, I got to watch this for college credit. <laughs> that's, uh, I was, I wondered, I knew you were going somewhere with the story and that, that makes perfect sense that that would make it extra, extra interesting or extra memorable um, because you probably were having to watch it fairly critically, even at, at critically as uh, for the class as well as watching it for enjoyment as a fan right and so like the whole thing was um uh we all went to someone's house and like you know everybody brought like you know two people brought soda and two people brought chips and two people brought like you know subway sandwiches you know the, the big long subway sandwiches because there was like 10 or 12 people in the class and so like we all just sort of showed up and hung out and watched the episode but then we did sit and talk about it afterward and it was a lot of fun to, and it was it was fun like twice because it was fun to take it with this super duper in-depth Star Wars person because the guy who led the class took it totally seriously. And so when we talked about it, most of what we were talking about was the original series. And um, this is uh, the day that this episode aired. This is what was happening in the news when this episode came on. Um, this is the kind of climate that this episode aired in so that you can see um, you know, and, and when you when you have all of that stuff kind of in your head as you watch the episode, like there's a lot more context. And so it becomes a very different show when you think about it actually being modern commentary. You know, you hear that all the time um, about how clever Star Trek was about doing all these different sorts of things. But when you actually sit down and think about like, here's what was happening. Here are the headlines from the week it aired or the biggest story of the year that this episode was aired in was this other thing. And so you think about all of that stuff and then you go in and watch the episode. It's a very different thing. Like for somebody who has no context, like I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't around the first time, you know, the first time through for the original series. So watch, so watching them that way was really interesting. And doing that also sort of made me pay more attention to how the world that I lived in was reflected in my Star Trek in next generation and so watching them that way was also a little different and it and it does viewing them through that sort of current events lens is kind of an interesting exercise as well something that struck me when i did the rewatch and in, in preparation for this is i i forgot how not shocked i was but when i when when this was on when it was live and, and you watched it live mm -hmm you got to see the, the characters at completely different ages um, yes. and, and both, both going backward in time and forward in time. And it was like, okay, this is, this is not what I expected. I don't know what I expected uh, <laughs> for a finale, but this was not it. And yet it, it, it not only did it work then, but it works now. It holds up real well as being a, a nice, a nice bookend or, or end of this uh, end of the series um, that you can really say, okay, you you feel like okay, we're moving into the movies. We can go on now because this part is over, but it's not it's not finished. It's not dead. You know that was um, 
that was one of the things that I really liked about this story as well. Um, a time travel. Um, so I know people probably hear me talk a lot, a lot about Doctor Who, which is another sci-fi that I adore. And um, one of my favorite flavors of Doctor Who episode is the one where um, the story that you're being told in the episode of Doctor Who is being told in the margins of a larger historical event, something that we already know. Like we know the rough outlines of what happened when Mount Vesuvius exploded. We know the rough outlines of um, uh, like Vincent van Gogh's life. And so then when Doctor Who goes back and visits that time and something happens in that specific era, um, you know, and he's sort of playing in the margins of a story that that is already, you know, a set thing, a fixed point in time, as Doctor Who likes to say. Um, that is another thing that I really liked about this one. And that that story in the margins was when he goes back to his first day in the Enterprise. And seeing that um, again, and, you know, and it was, it was really beautifully done, I think, um, because it did balance, you know, it's the end of the series, and so we go back to the beginning of the series, and watching, you know, the, the, some of the, the notes from that original episode, and having them at the end, and then also, like, they kind of brought out, like, you know, the big guns, like, you know, we ended also on a Q episode, and, you know, and the fate of mankind hanging in the balance and sort of watching that, watching that happen, you know, from both ends of, from, from both sort of sides of that story, uh, to me was also really, really fun. Like at the time, I just remember being really excited when Picard immediately gets up and starts shouting for Q and then he appears, you know, cause you're like, what are you talking? Oh, and then with the, and then, you know, and, and then watching him go for it and you know all and then seeing in the future and you know particularly having watched this very lately um you know the first shot we get of sort of future picard is him in a vineyard and we've now seen a trailer for a show about jean-luc picard well after the enterprise and everything else and where is he he's in a vineyard and so watching that now with that you know kind of in the back of my mind was also sort of funny but um you know, like there's, there were, there were a lot of things kind of in the middle of this that just were things that get, that gave it great appeal to me. And that was one of them was the throwback, not just to the beginning, but to a known story that we've already seen. We know how it turns out. We know what's supposed to happen with that particular unit of storytelling, you know, from the very beginning of the series and watching, um, you know, the interaction between everybody and all of the stuff that was implied, you know, in the future, um, you know, Captain Picard and both Jean-Luc and Beverly turn their heads, you know, yes. Um, you know, the fact that they're divorced and, you know, and she's a captain of a ship and that was really awesome, you know, also. Um, you know, like like little moments and like all the, all the weird friction between uh, Worf and Riker and the fact that Deanna had, had passed away and, you know, Jordy getting his vision back and, uh, you know, like, and Data with the weird gray streak in his hair, you know, like all these little things that, that had happened and all of the, like, all of the implied time that had passed, but it still felt like those relationships were still legit, you know, even though it had been all this time in the future. And, and I really enjoyed uh, those pieces of the story. And, you know, that was like... Like right from the be from the very beginning, I mean, you know, part of why I feel like this, what, why Next Generation also is my own Star Trek, is because uh, the original series, uh, when we get uh, Captain Kirk's narration at the beginning, he said, and I know this is so small, but it it was always a thing that I noticed even then, you know, as a kid. Um, uh, Captain Kirk's narration says, "Where no man has gone before." And Captain Picard's narration says where no one has gone before. And so like Captain Kirk's, Captain Kirk's world might include me, but Captain Picard's world totally does. And, you know, as, as a kid at the time who would walk into comic book stores and get weird looks and people wanted to know if I was there with my brother or with my boyfriend or whatever, like a hundred percent of the time that has gone down a little. Um, but not much, uh, <laughs> but being able to, like, being able to feel like that was a world that I was part of, 
you know, was a big deal to me. And so that was one thing that I always liked about the show from the very beginning. And then the other thing I really liked about this episode is that um, uh, it was full of hope. You know, hope and hope and faith are two ma- two things that go through both of these episodes. It's a two-parter. And both episodes, because it all relies on, like, Picard has to, is, is hoping that he's making the right decision and he has to rely on the other people around him having faith in him and believing this really bonkers story that he's trying to lay on them like it's true in each of these timelines. And all of that has to happen and he has to just firmly believe that this is absolutely the right thing that I'm doing and I know that I'm endangering other people, but I know that it's going to come out okay if I can make this happen. And he had to have a lot of faith in himself to make that work, you know, and everybody else had to, they had to have faith in him. They had to, you know, rely on their own hope. Like, I hope he's right. And I have faith that this is the thing that's going to happen. And it just fundamentally feels like an optimistic show. And not everything does, you know. Um, And you can draw a pretty straight line from this, for example, to Battlestar Galactica which got the new Battlestar Galactica, which got really dark because Ron Moore, who created the new Battlestar Galactica, worked on this show. And uh, he's listed as a producer on these two episodes. And, uh, you know, and like some of that gets really dark. You know, there's always kind of a little bit of of hope deep down in the bottom. And I feel like that's a little bit of of the Star Trek showing, you know, when, when you watch Battlestar Galactica and get that same sort of thing. So that's another reason like that this show is kind of dear to me is because like a lot of other stuff has come out of it that I like as a result of the people who worked on Next Generation that got to go on and do other things. Okay, there are a couple things in there you said that really resonated with me, and I want to try to hold them all in my head so we don't lose them. First, um, where no man has gone before versus where no one has gone before. Some of that, I think, is a reflection, and this is something I think you have to do with pretty much all track. You have to pay attention to roughly when they were made. I mean, if if you're not doing, if you're not paying attention for the because of the the state of the art of effects at the time, sometimes you have to do the state of the uh, of the social situation at the time. And I'm not just talking political either, but just the, the social situation where no man had gone before. I, you know, I, I'm I'm not going to get into a debate because I don't know about what the network insisted or what they would have what they would have said Mm -hmm. but you know it it was a time that things were a lot different things had evolved a lot by the time the next generation came along Mm -hmm. um you you said this is a time travel story and that's really interesting because i never think of this as a time travel story even though right out of the gate at the beginning picard says it feels like i'm moving back and forth in time so there there's no i i mean obviously you can explain that with q as to whether, was he really going back and forth in time or was he perceiving he was going back and forth in time? Because at the very end, they talk about why would Picard tell the crew what his experiences had been and Data explains mm-hmm. that, well, that was another timeline and so the timeline has already been changed so there's really no pollution of this timeline. Okay, that, that tied that up, but it, it, it leaves it very, in a very satisfyingly nebulous that, mm-hmm. you know, is he really going back and forth or is it just a feel like it? Is it all in his head? Um, you know, mm-hmm. if you listen to Q, you would, uh, you would assume that, yeah, there were really potential consequences here if he hadn't made the right choices. But it, it didn't get hung up in, in a time travel story. It no. was, you know, we didn't have that. The only thing was right. Q said, you know, you can't tell anybody. Okay, fine. Then, mm-hmm. then that solves that problem. So from a writing standpoint, you know, they – they left all these gaping holes and then they just sewed them right up real quick to mm-hmm. let the story move forward in in a very positive fashion. And I, I love that. I, I really love that. Yeah, that moment, I, I really enjoyed it too. And, and part of what I, I think one of the things I like about this story is that um, it's not, the point of it is not the time travel. You know, it's not one of the big holodeck stories where we go to turn of the century San Francisco. It's not, um, you know, it's not, we go through a wormhole and it's a whole other time. And what do we do? And there's this other timeline and all these people. And you know, how does this work? Like it wasn't any of that. And I really liked how, 
like you said, like there's a total balance between like all my questions were answered, but they didn't tell me every single thing about what happened or why it did that or how it worked or anything. But I am still satisfied with the ending that I got and the explanation of that particular story, you know, and, and, you know, and it can be debated. And it's one of those things where I feel like um, when people talk about like a satisfying ending, you know, I don't need 100% of my questions answered at the end of a series in order to be satisfied with the ending that I got. Like, I don't need to know every single thing that happened to every single character that we ever saw during the entire run of that whole show. Most of the, like, that's not always, you know, what I care about. Like, I care about, like, this thing, like, these plot threads and these these particular characters, and those are the ones I want to know about. And if you can answer those things for me more or less, you know, it's nice to have a little bit of room to debate. Like, well, maybe that's the job they got, or maybe that's another thing that happened. And it's nice to have those those opportunities. And the another thing about this this episode that's well done, not necessarily bec- you know that makes it something particular to me, but um, a thing that's really well done is that if you only watch the TV show and you watch the TV show beginning to end, you get a satisfying en- ending for a series of television for a unit of work and there it is and there's your seven seasons and they're beautiful and you can look at them and behold them and they're lovely and and you can move on with your life if you want to watch more star trek tv if you want to move on to the movies you can um but you don't have to and you get like a reasonably self-contained unit of entertainment in this in this particular series and that's another thing that i thought like from a storytelling perspective is really great like if you don't care about the films you don't have to and you kind of know what happened and I really liked the explanation that Data gave which was you know that maybe he told us about this so it isn't what happens you know yeah. by telling us he he helped us make sure that that's not the future that we ended up with and you know and it's not a future that we want so let's make sure it doesn't happen you know and it was a nice thing the episode works on so many levels because there is the story there is the tension um, if you buy into Q being willing to destroy the human race um, and in which they sell it. So yeah, you buy it. Um, oh, yeah. But there was also the, the interpersonal relationships, the, the fact that these people, you know, sure, there've been some things that maybe drove a couple apart. Um, uh, Picard and Dr. Crusher being apparently married and then divorced. And, you know, what's the whole backstory there? Well, mm-hmm. they didn't even try to address that. <laughs> I know it is it, that you just take it is because now you've jumped into that into the future um mm-hmm. Orf and, and Riker you know being at odds um but at the end of the day everybody still cares about everybody in some fashion I mean mm-hmm. okay Riker Riker and Worf haven't spoken in 20 years and yet it takes one situation where Riker says hey we could we could use a hand and Worf said and Riker, you know, is sneaking along behind Picard watching him because he didn't trust him that he wouldn't, you know, try to do what he's not supposed yeah. to do. So all of this just yeah. speaks to the fact that even though there's frustration and potentially, and, and this is a little bit dangerous comment here, frustration with someone who's older and maybe, you know, you could explain their behavior in a lot of different ways. Um, mm-hmm. They're still following along, watching after him, making sure he's okay. And right. I, I found that really, really satisfying. I really liked the kind of the guardrails of Riker, you know, showing up there kind of at the end. Um, and, it, you know, for the same reason. And, you know, like it's another uh, storytelling decision that we find out that uh, Troy passed away and we, we don't know what happened to her. We don't know how she died. We don't know the, the state of anyone's relationship with anybody at that point. Like we don't know what the deal was with her and Riker. We don't know what the deal was with her and Worf, like at that moment, you know? Um, so we never really, we never really hear about it and we don't hear about it again. Like Worf pops up on DS9 and he doesn't really talk about him and Deanna and what happened there. You know, we don't, right. we don't know. We just never find out. And, you know, and, and I think that's okay. Like for the, for the purposes of the story we were told, and the story that that we, that they were trying to tell, you know, it would have been nice to have heard what happened to her, you know. But I totally get not spending a whole bunch of time sitting around in ten forward chatting, you know, like that. They didn't have a lot of time for it. Um, and I feel like a whole lot of stuff happens in this episode in these two parts. Um, 
it doesn't feel overstuffed and it never feels overwhelming. Like, it never feels like they just jammed a whole bunch of stuff in there. Like it, it, it clips along at a nice pace, but it's not way too fast. And there was never a point where, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like I have no idea what they're talking about. Um, you know, did I miss something earlier or is this conversation just not supposed to make any sense or anything like that? It was really nice to have that, that opportunity you know, to kind of move right along with it. It's, it's a story that gives the audience a certain amount of credit. And that's also a thing I really like in a, in a story is you don't have to hold my hand through the entire thing. Yeah, but it also doesn't drag. I mean, yeah. the pacing of it is, is really good. You're right. It, it didn't happen too fast. So they were trying to pack a whole bunch of ideas in at the end of the series. Right. But they also didn't stretch it out to have it cover two, two different episodes. Right. It's, it's a story. They took this long to tell it. They, they give you just enough details to have it make sense. There are a few things that, yeah, I really would like to know, the, the, you know what happened in, in between. But it, it would not add to the story or it didn't detract from the story not having that information. Right. And that, I think that's the important piece is, yes, it would have added to the story, but the story is not lessened because it isn't there. And I think that was the balance that they managed to strike like through both pieces, both parts. And, and that's hard. Like, you know, we've seen two-parters in a lot of shows. Like, lots and lots of shows have two-parters. And sometimes they do well at telling that unit of story in two episodes instead of one. And sometimes they don't. And sometimes, like, stuff goes way too fast and you have to watch it a few times to pick up all the details so that you, under, you have a clear idea what's happening. And sometimes it sort of feels like you... When you have to turn in a report that's on length, you know, it's not necessarily like right until you've covered everything, but like it has to be five pages. So you double space and you use like a 16 point font. Like sometimes a two parter will feel like that. Like it was a part and a half, but we can only have one or two and we can't right. cut anything else out or it won't make any sense and the whole thing falls over. So it's going to be two, but it's going to be double spaced, you know, and like some, you know, we're going to inch the margins in to an inch and a quarter or whatever. And, you know, that sort of thing happens sometimes too. And this did not do that. And having watched enough two part episodes of stuff on TV in my life, um, you can tell when that's what's happening. Even if you can't put your finger on it, you can tell like this was really an episode and a half that ended up being two. Or um, this really needed to be an episode and a half instead of one. And, you know, and that's what you get. And so this, I feel like this had a really nice balance all the way through. And, uh, and, I th and it holds up. Like watching it now, it doesn't feel weird. It's not cringy. Um, there's not that moment of like, ooh, you know, like you sometimes get when you watch something from a number of years ago and kind of go, oh, I, I, I forgot they, oh, yeah, you know, um, and you know, and 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 lots of shows have that, and there are other parts of, of this that do. I mean, like all the female uniforms in the first couple seasons, like you know, just saying. But um, like for the most part, like this is like as a unit of, of storytelling. Uh, watching it now doesn't feel weird or out of place or anything, and I really liked, and it, and it was really fun to revisit. You know. Um, like BBC America sometimes will do the thing where they just run next generation like all day long, all night long for like three, four days at a time. And sometimes I will just put it on there because it's like my cozy sweater and my kids like Mr. Rogers, you know, like it's just com it's comfort food sort of it's like comfort food, but TV um, like I will put them on and I don't care what season it is. I don't care what episode it is. Uh, I don't care about any of those things. I just really like those parts. And, um, you know, and like, you know, and Q is my favorite, like of all the, of all of the weird stuff they run up against, Q is my favorite. And I have to tell you why, because Q is played by an actor whose name is John Delancey. And in the eighties, John Delancey was on Days of Our Lives, which is a show I also watch. I have watched that in essence, my entire life. I don't remember a time when I didn't watch it um, because my mom watches it. Hi, mom. And uh, my mom watched it religiously. And so uh, there were points where 
uh, like, like it was like literally the only conversation we could have without fighting because I was a teenager. And so like the only thing we could talk about, the only thing we really had in common was like, did you see days of our lives? Did you see what he's doing? It's so terrible. And why are the two of them together? And these two need to break up and you know, on and on. Like that was one of the few conversations we could actually have. And we always have that. We have that conversation now. Like I still will. I still watch days of our lives. I'm, I'm out of that closet. Um, but he was on that show and he played a scientist on days of our lives whose name was Eugene and uh, on the show he built a time machine and he got in it and was going to go to other times and it went wrong and he disappeared and he never came back and then every so often his wife would see him because he would get close to being there and he would be like in a cowboy hat and the full cowboy getup, and it was the wild west era you know and he would show up and he would be like hooting and hollering and he'd have a six gun in his hand and he would appear in front of her and she always tried to tell other people that she saw him nobody would believe it and everybody just thought that she really really missed eugene and so he popped up occasionally as the you know as his time machine had varying degrees of success getting him back to where he wanted to be, which was back with his wife. And so, like, when you think, like, I remember him from that. And then when this show started, you know, Next Generation, I sit down and I watch this first episode of this new Star Trek thing that everybody told me would be good. And I sit down and I watch it and I'm like, wait, I remember him from another show. And the reason he's not on that show anymore was a time travel accident. So in my head, it's the same dude. And that's how he ended up as, as Q is because he had this time machine and it just went really wrong and superpowers. And now he wears a way better outfit than anything he ever wore in Days of Our Lives and is now putting the human race on trial. So that's my own personal theory. I did not know that. I mean, <laughs> I'm not a big TV uh, trivia guy. You know, the shows I was interested in, I'm interested in, and that's, you know, pretty much it. I did not know that about Delancey. I mean, he is a brilliant actor. He's so um, good. He is so good. He had no good. business on Days of Our Lives, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've, seen, I've seen him in other things, but, you know, so, so you get a taste of, his, of the depth of his acting. But you're right, as Q, he is, is absolutely phenomenal. And, and, yes, he's but I have no, I... I am not going back and watch Days of Our Lives, Kelly. Not going to happen. <laughs> no, I don't recommend it. Um, as a fun, as a fun thing, you can find Eugene and Calliope clips like on YouTube and things where people and you can see like all the hair and the shoulder pads and the blue eyeshadow of that particular era of Days of Our Lives, which is fantastic. Like as a piece of anthropology, you know, like here's what here's what the world was like in the olden days and you know, and like in that sort of thing. So uh, like, and you would be shocked how often I look up and go, that guy used to be on Days of Our Lives. <laughs> um, <laughs> because it's way more than I thought I would ever do. And it turns out like it's lots of people. Um, but anyway, like that's like, for me, that was one of the things that was sort of fun, at least initially about seeing Q was it was this dude from, that was a time traveler in the first place. And so, yeah, in my head, uh, there's a very straight line between those two characters. Eugene Bradford went off and ended up becoming part of the queue. So before we wrap this up, there's one other character that I want to mention that we haven't talked mm -hmm. about at all that I really loved the, the way that that character came in and was part of the sort of the rousing conclusion part of this. And that is the enterprise itself because oh. the enterprise decloaks comes up, Riker says, we're going to try to get the Klingon's attention. And it proceeds to punch holes in a couple cruisers and blow one up. And it, it was just such a, you know, riding out of the sunset kind of moment for the Enterprise itself that I loved. Because the Enterprise has always been a character in, yes. in the show. I mean, from, mm -hmm. from the original series right on, right on through to the modern day. The ship is always something of a character. And I thought that was just such a great way because up to that point, you know, we'd had a couple, uh, a couple long shots of the, of the enterprise, but not a lot. And so it had its moment moment in the sun in the last episode as well. And I just, I thought it was brilliant the way it was done. Well, and we got the little, the, the sort of uh, motion picture nod, you know, have you ever been on a galaxy class starship before? There she is. And it's not, it's not the shot we get in the motion picture, but it's a nice, 
wide shot. And especially if you watch them now on the um, cleaned up but not rejiggered versions of the, you know, that, that you can get now where like it's been remastered and, you know, they, they kind of brushed out some of the strings and things like that and, and just made the effects a little nicer but didn't change anything. George Lucas. Um, I don't have strong feelings about that at all either. But like you get this really beautiful shot of it. And then, you know, we get a couple shots like from the view screen of an enterprise of two other enterprises also on the scene. And like, so, you know, like you're talking about, I felt like that was a big, a big send off for that particular character as well. And it was really neat to see, to see how they, how they did that. And, you know, kind of the different looks of the bridge uh, through time, you know, that was kind of fun. And yeah, the, the enterprise is just as big a character as anything else. I mean, yeah. And I liked that this sort of had kind of um, one thing I liked about this one was the way they handled some of the stereotypical stuff that you get in a Star Trek episode, like a subspace anomaly and ejecting the warp core. And like the only thing we didn't get was saucer separation. Like that's the only thing missing from this episode that, you know, that, that they kind of went to a whole lot during next generation, you know, um, but you know, or or reversing a polarity. I don't think we reversed any polarities in, in either of these episodes either. I don't uh, think so, but I have to go back. We, got, back the we got the warp shell. We got we got the the warp shell. But I think yeah. that was about it. And so it was, but it was kind of fun to see how they they sort of included those things without without it being a whole thing about it. And so it was it was really fun to watch, and it was fun to rewatch. Like I said, and uh, and that's and like yeah, I. I admit I am team Star Wars deep in my heart, but like, but I like Star Trek. And, you know, I told somebody one time, um, I only know a couple of phrases in Klingon. So I'm not like a huge Star Trek fan. And somebody said, if you know, and that person said, if you know any phrases in Klingon, you're a really big Star Trek fan. And I'm, okay. <laughs> I guess I'm a big Star Trek fan. Yeah. It, so. it depends on your measurement. Yeah. Kelly, this has been really interesting. Thank you for sharing some of your, <laughs> some of your thoughts and all because it it it, it was it sounds like it was a uh, the next generation was a journey for you. This was the end of that journey, yes. and, and and I appreciate the way that you know you came to some of it and 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 the way that it it affected you. But I do want to make sure that we give folks a chance to find out where else they can find you, what else you're doing now, because I know you're constantly ending projects, starting projects, and doing a lot of things. <laughs> As we yes. record this, what are the places where folks can hear what all you do? Uh, you can find me on Twitter as Verso. You should find me on micro.blog as Verso. Um, you can hear me uh, on The After Show at aftershowpodcast.com, which is a show I do with Mike Rose from uh, uh, because we decided we wanted to keep podcasting after uh, the unofficial Apple weblog folded. So... Um, We've been we've been recording that for a while, and you can go find those. Uh, I am also on the Mac Observer Daily Observations podcast weekday mornings, and so five mornings a week you can hear us talk about a couple of topics. Uh, first thing in the morning on the West Coast, and um, it's a quick twenty minute show with a couple of headlines and you know maybe a PSA about the latest way that Facebook is messing with you. And we also, uh, I also appear occasionally on the Incomparable Network where my show, Greetings from the Uncanny Valley, which is a, po a Westworld podcast, is on the verge of making a comeback because as we record this, it is the first day of San Diego Comic-Con and one of the things that's happening at Comic-Con is a Westworld panel and presumably at that panel there will be a new trailer and once there's a new trailer, Don and I are going to go talk all about it. And so uh, that's actually going to be our first episode back. And then we're going to do a rewatch that hopefully will take us into 2020 when we finally get new episodes in season three. Is that all? Um, well, you can hear me on the incomparable doing other stuff too once in a while. Um, I, I will occasionally be on uh, what they call the mothership, the incomparable um, talking about pop culture stuff. If there's a movie or a TV show or something. And then um, some of the other shows I pop up on, occasionally over there a couple um i've done game shows and and some things like that so uh and any any other stuff that i am generally up to you can usually find out on uh twitter or on micro.blog great 
Kelly, thank you so much again. I really appreciate you coming on, especially on a, uh, the, the early episodes of Trek Favorites um, as we sort of find our footing and, and, and figure out just what we're going to do. This is exactly, uh, everyone I've talked to so far, these are exactly the kind of conversations I had hoped to have. So thank you. Thanks for having we'll talk me. To you, talk to you soon. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Trek Favorites. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook. Uh, you can email me, Chuck, at trekfavorites.com. I'd like to know what your Trek favorites are and what your reactions are to the show and to Kelly's comments. Um, I think this was, this was a great episode of The Next Generation. It's one we both agree on. I'd like to know what you think. <laughs> Until the next time, thanks for watching. Visit trekfavorites.com to access all our shows, watch the video versions on our YouTube channel, and connect with us on Twitter and Facebook as at Trek Favorites.